Hey guys, Tyler here. The Universal Translator is a rather ubiquitous technology in the Star Trek universe. Also referred to as the UT, or Translator Circuit, the technology is used to decipher and interpret alien languages into the native language of the user. And of all the futuristic devices in Star Trek, it's one of the most obvious that exists primarily as a convention to aid storytelling. The UT enables most dialogue between characters to be written and delivered in English for the convenience of the writers and viewers alike. It eliminates the need to devise a new language for each alien of the week that appears on screen, and viewers do not have to watch subtitles. But how exactly does a device like this function in-universe, and how would it function if it existed in our universe? Other than the fact that realistically, talking to an alien through the UT should be like watching a badly dubbed foreign movie. But let's find out. We see in the episode Carbon Creek that Vulcans have presumably developed Universal Translator technology without the need for a visible device by the year 1957. But the earliest Universal Translator on Earth is invented shortly before 2151, and it is still experimental when the NX-01 Enterprise launches in that year. The actual translation unit is a handheld device with a keypad and display that can be attached to a communicator. Despite being able to translate unknown languages in in relatively short order. Due to this UT's experimental nature, the use of a skilled linguist, such as the Enterprise's Hoshi Sato, is still required. This is particularly true in situations where the crew must read alien languages on control panels, patches, or displays. A new language can be quickly translated in person-to-person -person encounters by having an individual speak their language until the UT gathers enough data to build a translation matrix. This translation matrix facilitates the conversion of symbols and sounds, and early versions of it are even employed on the Friendship One probe launched in 2067. In the 21 1960s, Sato invents a more robust version of this matrix, called Lingua Code, specifically to anticipate and speed up alien language translation in first contact scenarios. Indeed, Lingua Code friendship messages are transmitted from the Epsilon 9 station as the V'ger cloud approaches in Star Trek The Motion Picture, but to no avail, as it is later speculated by Spock that V'ger is incapable of receiving this primitive form of communication. Only after the Lingua Code transmission is adjusted to a frequency of more than 1 million megahertz does Vija receive and understand the Federation's peaceful intentions, ceasing its attack. And in the TNG episode Tin Man, Tam Elbrin suggests Lingua Code is insufficient to communicate with the Cosmozoan life form GOM2, surmising that only direct telepathic contact will suffice. Without the UT attachment, mid 22nd century Starfleet communicators are still capable of translating pre programmed languages, including Akali, as seen in the episode Civilization. By 2155, Sato's work makes it possible for small translators to be clipped onto clothing, capable of translating a variety of languages simultaneously. This is especially important in allowing the conference discussing the coalition of planets to occur in real time without in-person or networked translators among the delegates. UTs are fully incorporated into Starfleet communicators by the 2230s, directing translated audio towards the recipient in the speaker's voice. This is demonstrated when Lieutenant Philippa Georgiou makes first contact with the Kelpian Saru, and in 2256 when Michael Burnham uses her communicator to eavesdrop on Commander Cole aboard the Klingon sarcophagus. By this point, UTs within communicators can be programmed with more than a thousand languages, and UTs are built into the communication systems of most starships, including shuttlecraft. They do still occasionally have difficulty translating the Saurian language into Federation Standard, the latter of which is demonstrated on multiple occasions to be descended from English. One question though that many fans have had over the years is, how on earth could the UT possibly anticipate the structure of alien languages before a single word is even spoken? Well, the TOS episode Metamorphosis serves as the first confirmation that the UT does in fact scan brainwaves. In the case of the non-humanoid, non-corporeal companion of Gamma Canaris N, 
Captain Kirk explains that there are certain ideas and concepts that are universal to all intelligent life. The UT compares the frequencies of brainwave patterns, selects ideas it recognizes, and provides the necessary grammar. He further explains that the device speaks with an approximation of a voice that corresponds to the identity concepts it recognizes. The companion is revealed to be female because the UT detects this facet of its identity from its brainwave patterns and thus assigns it a female voice. Ferengi translators, which start out as handheld devices in the 22nd century, become miniaturized devices inserted into the ear by the 24th century. By this time, Federation UTs have advanced to the point where they can be built into the comm badges of Starfleet personnel, and the scope of languages they can translate has been widened as well. As seen in TNG's evolution, the UT is able to translate a language used by sentient nanites into binary. And with some modifications, it's even able to interpret the growls of the quadrupedal cave-dwelling Graflax of Balkus 9, as seen in the Lower Decks episode, um, Caves. That said, it's important to point out that the UT's capabilities are mainly focused on interpreting the brain patterns of humanoid life forms. It has trouble, for instance, translating the cytoplasmic life form in the Voyager episode Nothing Human and the xenon based life form in Hope and Fear. But it has some luck with the symbiotic life form in Enterprise's Voxola. Even among other humanoids, besides Saurians, the UT in the late 24th century famously has trouble translating the Tamarians metaphorical manner of speaking, merely translating their literal words into English, as seen in Darmok. Shaka. When the walls fell and other species, whose languages require hours of analysis or specific manual adjustments to translate, are the Screans, Vorta, and Breen. So it should be pretty clear that, with all aliens, the UT can be kind of hit or miss, like most advanced technologies. While the specific way the Universal Translator functions is kind of contrived, to be fair, it does have some merit to it. For one, when it comes to anticipating grammar and syntax, the idea that non-human animals' communication follows a pattern is rooted in real-world science. Specifically, birdsong has been identified to possess some linguistic properties. Domestic chickens have distinct alarm calls for aerial and ground predators and respond to these alarm calls appropriately. That said, studies to demonstrate the existence of grammar and syntax among birds have been difficult due to the wide range of possible interpretations. Some research on parrots claims to demonstrate innate ability for grammatical structures, such as an understanding of the difference between nouns, adjectives, and verbs. Yeah, that's crazy. In the wild, the vocalizations of black-capped chickadees have been rigorously shown to exhibit grammar-compliant sentence structures made from a finite vocabulary, and studies on starlings have suggested their vocalizations might have similar structures. To take it a step further, studies in parakeets have demonstrated a striking similarity between the verbal areas of talking birds' brains and the equivalent areas of human brains. Now, why am I talking about birds? Well, they are one of the most intelligent types of animal besides the order that includes primates like us. And that has implications for the translation of possible languages among other animals considered intelligent, like cetaceans, elephants, and octopuses. But how can that be extrapolated to literal extraterrestrials who didn't evolve on the same planet as us? Well, like a lot of other things, it comes back to the fact that in Star Trek, all humanoid life is descended from the ancient humanoid's genetic code, seeded four and a half billion years ago in the primordial oceans of countless M-class planets. This led to the development of broadly similar anatomical structures in a variety of contexts, including brain chemistry, which helps facilitate the UT's translation matrix. And so it makes sense that the UT would have trouble with lots of non-humanoid life forms, with successful contacts the result of brain patterns that are close enough to what the UT's familiar with. As for how we'd communicate with aliens in real life, well, that's a more complicated question, with a more complicated answer. Dun dun dun. I was trying to do a thing, I don't know if it worked. Up to this point, potential first contact messages have primarily relied on binary code, including the Arecibo message sent towards star cluster M13 in 1974, which contains part of the periodic table 
information about DNA, a graphic of the human form and solar system, and more. The golden records on Voyager 1 and 2 contain images and audio portraying the life and culture of Earth as a sort of time capsule. There's also the plaque on Pioneer 10 and 11, which features illustrations of the human figure and symbols providing information on the origin of the spacecraft. It's suspected that math would be a universal language, even if it's not an inherent property of the universe, since whatever base you're working with, math is math. Why would they change math? Ah, math is math. So math crazy, is math. These methods are probably our best bet for making contact with aliens given the relative unlikelihood that their brain chemistry would be that similar to ours. Which is why I think movies like Arrival are a more plausible depiction of communicating with aliens. But within the context of the Trek universe, I think the UT actually gets a bad rap. It's a technology like any other that functions based on an advanced understanding of the universe that we're just now starting to grasp. With that, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash orange river, link in the description, or become a YouTube member by clicking the join button on my channel page. I just want to give a quick shout out to all of my donors who allow me to bring on talent like editors to make more high quality content for you to enjoy. By becoming a patron or member, you also get access to awesome perks like behind the scenes photos and videos, patron and member only polls, name in the credits, merch discounts, and more. Or you can drop a one-time super thanks or PayPal donation. All are appreciated. Links to my PayPal as well as my social media and merch store are in the description too. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper. Thank you.